Okay, this video is about my latest publication in Bioessays, and it's entitled Can all major ROS forming sites of the respiratory chain be activated by high FADH2 NADH ratios? Um, and a subtitle, and that's a pretty important subtitle in this case, Ancient Evolutionary Constraints Determine Mitochondrial ROS Formation. And with mitochondrial ROS formation, it also determines eukaryotic evolution. And that actually is probably the most important aspect. So this title contains a few things that are rather complicated. FADH2 NADH ratios and ROS forming sites. What are we talking about here? Um, first of all, let me say that these aspects of the respiratory chain and the respiratory chain is the electron transport chain that generates ATP in mitochondria. I'll explain these um, uh, terms later. This chain is what makes eukaryotes eukaryotes. Not that there is such a chain. Bacteria have these chains as well. But that the chain is located inside the eukaryotic cell. And that makes all the difference. So, all these different aspects about mitochondria that make them special compared to prokaryotes, such as RK and bacteria, I think most of them can be explained by looking at internal ROS formation and efficient ATP generation by the uptake of a bacterium that became the mitochondria. So why is mitochondrial ROS formation so important? And why does the bacterium that has been taken up make more ROS than it originally did, because something, you could say, goes wrong as well as goes perfectly in eukaryotes. And for that, we have to look at the respiratory chain itself, and especially the respiratory chain in the mitochondria on the first part. Okay, so this is the respiratory chain, and you could say it's an ATP battery. You make ATP very efficiently from food. And how do you do that? Food contains very energy-rich electrons, and these electrons you allow to travel along this respiratory chain. You can follow these brown lines. They end up at oxygen, they form water, and that's it. And that's it. Where does the ATP come from? Well, during this electron flow, this traveling of, electron, of electrons, protons are pumped. So hydrogen plus, you could say, or not hydrogen plus, but uh, um, the proton. So H plus is being displaced from the inside of the mitochondria to the inner membrane space. So you have a displacement of charge. Does that remind you of anything? Yes, it reminds you of a battery. And you can use this uploading of a battery to make ATP by allowing the protons to flow back and then ATP is formed. And that is a very efficient way of doing things. And this is the hallmark of a lot of efficiency gain in eukaryotes. That's one of the reasons why, so, why they are so special. So why can you make such an enormous amount of ATP? Because you end up at this very electron negative element, oxygen. So oxygen really allows you to get an enormous amount of ATP. But is that all good? No, it's also a little bit bad, because oxygen and electrons traveling along a route can also do something you wouldn't expect, uh, not form water, but form oxygen radicals. That's ROS, reactive oxygen species, and a reactive oxygen species can destroy everything. Well, you could say, let's make a perfect electron flow, then nothing can go wrong. But that's impossible for eukaryotes, because they use different food sources. And what's optimal for one, the breakdown of one, for glucose, sugar for instance, is not so optimal for the other one, if you start breaking down fatty acids. And that's shown, and so here electrons end up at uh, oxygen forming water if everything goes okay, but if oxygen already attaches itself to electrons earlier on, you've lost that dangerous reactive species. So let's have a closer look at the first part of the electron, train, uh, electron uh, transport chain. And this is really where you can see that there is a difference if things come from fat, fatty acids, or sugar. 
And the interesting thing is that electrons from these food sources can enter the ETC in different spots. And you have to take my word for it, in glucose, um, five electrons come from NADH, and they go via this first complex, and only one goes via this light green complex. So you have a ratio of 5 to 1, and an electron flow that you can adapt to this ratio. Now, let's suppose that you start burning fatty acids. The longer the fatty acid, the more electrons enter after complex 1, by this dark green complex over here. And in that case, you have an NADH to FADH2 ratio of 2. So only 2 NADH per 1 FADH2. And that's a different kind of flow. And you can imagine, especially if the battery is loaded up, that this leads to all kinds of problems. And indeed, under these kind of circumstances, you get loss formation, a problem. So uh, how can the cell solve this problem? Well, the amount of reduced ubiquinone, and that's where the electrons end up before they are used by the next complex, that reduction state is crucial. Interesting point, by the way. This whole process of ROS formation is worsened by the fact that complex 3 does something strange. It takes up electrons from QH2, making Q again, but it has a cycle in which it also gives off electrons again to Q, making QH2. Why does it do this? Because this is probably one of the oldest forms of transferring protons from the inside to the outside. The QH2 that is made into Q on top releases its protons in the intermembrane space, while the second one uses protons taken from the matrix. So this is an old-fashioned constraint that you can do nothing about. And that means that complex 3 competes with complex 1 and these other complexes for Q. And that's a difficult situation to solve. OK, what does the eukaryotic cell do? The eukaryotic cell has a normal flow, you could say, with sugar, shown over here. Now suddenly, when you start burning fatty acids, Many more electrons come from this complex, and you get reversed electron transport, that's ROS formation in complex one, and you also get more difficulties to give off your electrons again to Q during the Q cycle in complex three. Also there, ROS formation. Well, at the lower part, you can see what you can do to resolve this whole problem. Well, there are a few things that you can do. You can either lower the membrane potential, so your battery. That means that it becomes easier for the electrons to go out of this loop and to the next phase, attach themselves to oxygen forming water, that's one. You can also lower the amount of electrons that come via this green complex in beta oxidation. And one of the things that eukaryotes evolved to do this is to do part of beta oxidation, that's fatty acid breakdown, in a totally different location in the cell. So I think peroxisomes were a eukaryotic invention to get around this problem. So these are just a few of the things that cells can do. What can they do uh, for other situations? Whenever one of these complexes, and I didn't talk about the top one, that's a very specific one that's induced during turboglycolysis. You can look that up if you're interested. In all these cases, when more electrons flow in via these complexes and the QH2, so the reduced form, becomes, you could say, the preponderant one, where there's more than enough QH2 but not enough Q, then the cell reacts by lowering the membrane potential by bringing in uncoupling proteins. So the protons can flow back without using ATP synthase and making ATP. And that you can nicely uh, summarize in a catchy phrase, I think it's a catchy phrase, and that's stimulate an F, get an UCP. So if you use a complex that uses FADH2 as the prosthetic factor, you have to induce uncoupling proteins. And that has been borne out over the last 10 years uh, since I first uh, published about this model. I feel good about it. Okay, so last but not least, 
Why do I think that internal loss formation was crucial for eukaryotic evolution? Because quite a lot of things can be understood that way. For instance, eukaryotic cells have meiotic sex. That's actually a repair system for DNA. Why don't bacteria need that? Because now we have more DNA, the DNA of two organisms integrated, so there is more to destroy, you could say. And secondly, there's an internal mutation factor, reactive oxygen species, so also the mutation rate goes up. So you really need something like meiotic sex. Peroxisomes, I already explained, also a eukaryotic invention to get around internal loss formation during beta oxidation, so the burning of fatty acids. Okay, I think these are just a few nice examples that show you that eukaryotes can only be that eukaryotes can only be understood if you take internal loss formation by the respiratory chain along the lines that I just sketched into account. So this is why I think that you should read the publication and read all the other publications around the subject as well. Uh, the video by Nick Decker and myself was produced here, and we hope you uh, didn't fall asleep, because it's complicated stuff. Thank you for your attention.